now that you can't eat for the next two hours, we're going to talk about food for an hour. Um, so yeah, I'm Zach, she's Kat, and we're from the Center for Genomic Gastronomy. Um, so I guess so far we've been so impressed about the range of talks about food, food hacking, and biotech, DIY bio at this conference. It's been really good to see and the range of uh, ideas and meet with people. Um, oh, you're doing that one, right? Okay. Yeah. So uh, we're going to introduce ourselves a little bit more thoroughly. We're going to sort of define this word food freaking that we've been working with for the last year and see if you can add to it. Um, we're going to talk about some of our research methods, uh, share a few of our projects, uh, introduce a new journal we've launched. This is the number zero issue um, and see if you guys want to help us take it forward. And then a uh, conclusion with some Q&A. Um, um, yeah. Yes, so hello. So uh, for the introduction, we just thought we'd give you a quick uh, insight into what the Center for Genomic Gastronomy is. Um, we call ourselves an independent research institute. We started this about three years ago, and it was a small uh, project, and it's sort of become a framework for us to uh, create work and think about food issues. And so I think with that, genomic astronomy considers um, economics, politics, culture, and technology, and take, take sort of a systems approach to food. So uh, we've collaborated with um, a variety of scientists, chefs, hackers, uh, activists in North America, Europe, and Asia. And we kind of disseminate our work through different things, such as uh, exhibitions, talks like this one, uh, meals, and publications. And for a slightly more technical talk, you can see our uh, 28C3 talk. Um, that was the first hacker conference we ever spoke at. It was awesome. This, today's supposed to be more fun because you guys are so hot, and we're hopefully going to try to entertain you and make it not so technical. But we still have to do a few definitions uh, just to make sure we're all on the same page. Um, so each uh, part of our name of our organization was really specifically uh, chosen. So when we say genomics, what we mean is uh, the science or the, the technology enables scientists to study genetic variability and interactions between all of an organism's genes and the environment. So it's not as reductive as genetics. Um, gastronomy is the art of eating food. And then we think of genomic gastronomy um, as the study of organisms' environments that are manipulated by human food cultures. So the way that what we choose to grow, what we choose to eat, even down to like what flavor preferences we have, um, affect all the things that happen upstream in terms of uh, biology, ecology, the life sciences. And uh, if you see in the background of this picture, uh, it, there's a poster we made called We've Always Been Biohackers, which um, we've been saying for a while because uh, trying to get away from this idea of anything in the food system being natural, uh, we've been hacking the food system and the plants and animal genomes in the food system since the dawn of agriculture, basically. So uh, we try not to get hung up in the word natural, and uh, let that lets us be sort of more specific about critiques of food and the politics. Um, so almost done with the sort of uh, uh, preamble stuff. We have a, we have a mission statement. Um, yeah, so the Center for Genomic Gastronomy is an independent research institute that examines the biotechnologies and biodiversity of human food systems. So when we're talking about biotechnology, uh, we're taking a really broad uh, view of what that actually means. So we're sort of suggesting that cheesemakers and brewers should also be in on conversations about emerging technologies. And these are six of the sort of biotechnologies that we're interested in. So cheese making, brewing, seed saving, selective breeding, and then mutagenesis and transgenesis. And we have one small correction to this slide. We have a DeLong conversation with a life scientist who suggests that we use the more specific technical term mutation breeding. So uh, we'll fix that the next time we show this slide. Yeah. Um, so in terms of biodiversity, uh, what we're interested in is the biodiversity of the kitchen in particular. Although we talk to people who are farmers, uh, agronomists, we're really interested sort of uh, in the gastronomy side. So we talk about the biodiversity of the kitchen and um, the sort of culinary biodiversity, not only agricultural biodiversity. And, you know, I think there's a big question for us, which is which of the mutants that we've made over the last 10,000 years of having agriculture do we want to love? Um, which organisms and environments that we continue to manipulate um, are the ones that we want to protect and uh, to m retain because we're losing huge amounts of uh, agricultural and culinary biodiversity. And then finally, our mission is basically to map food controversies, uh, to prototype alternative culinary futures, and to imagine a more just, biodiverse, and beautiful food system. 
So uh, slides are actually a technology, just like books, and sometimes you need a sort of a how-to guide. So we have a couple of quick notes for the rest of this talk. Um, whenever you see something that's like neon pink and gold like this, it's from this food freaking journal that we're putting together. Um, it might look like this. Um, so that's just so when you see the neon pink, you'll know it's from food freaking. And um, yeah, we have some copies up here if you want to see them at the end. And it's CC licensed, and we'll, we have a PDF to email you if you want one. When you see yellow like this, um, that means we're drawing uh, from some food database. Uh, in this case, um, it is the European Commission's DOOR, Database of Origin and Registration, and it's a session for Roquefort cheese that we've drawn on. Um, we put this up here because partly what we're interested in is the technical specifications of uh, modernist contemporary food cultures. That's one of the relations we see with um, freaking and, and hacking, particularly freaking, is there's these systems that we haven't invented and designed, but we need to learn all the sort of technical uh, terms for them. So what is food freaking? Um, it's sort of still an open question for us, and we'd love to sort of hear what you guys think. And for now, I guess what we, the way we got to food freaking was there was a lot of talk of food hacking, and um, the activities that we saw happening in this food hacking space was very much sort of hardware hacking and making DIY sous vide machines and that kind of thing. And because we're more interested in this kind of exploring the systems approach, we looked at the history of phone freaking and thought, well, that's a beautiful metaphor to take forward, and what would, you know, freaking the food system look like? And so um, it's sort of also this idea of exploring and exploiting an existing system as opposed to creating one, and instead of telephone networks, we're interested in food networks. So that's sort of the... The, defin the sort of definition we have for it as of now. But and it's definitely it's not in opposition to food hacking. It's probably a continuum. We don't even know if this is a real thing. <laughs> it's just the way we create metaphors and can draw on a different subcultural history uh, that probably a lot of you guys know a lot about. Um, we love food hackers. Um, so yeah, so we're going to mash up, uh, continue to look at uh, freaking and other sort of uh, critical technologists and uh, borrow some uh, of their language and make new metaphors and hopefully make some new alliances. Uh, we saw a talk yesterday that was really great, I think on this stage, um, that was a seed saver from the EU. And of course, there's the Food Hack Lab over there. So we're hoping to pull all these folks together. Um, as I mentioned, one of the things we're really geeky about is, are these food databases. So here are the ones, some of the ones we'll show you today. Um, and it's one of the things that I think a lot of uh, uh, home farmers and uh, foodies that we talk to are not so interested in, and because we're super geeks, we are. And um, so it's, it's an interesting uh, point of conversation to use these databases to do something sort of creative with them. Um, and there's usually numbers associated with them. Um, and I think there's the last slide on this food freaking idea and what it might be. Uh, but basically, we think it sits somewhere between food technology and open culture. OK, uh, so now we're going to talk about some of our research methods. Sorry, this is like such a big space. We'd usually have questions as we go, but I think that's going to be uh, too tough. Um, has anyone heard about this story, the um, surprise genetically modified uh, wheat that was found in Oregon in the US last month? OK, wow, almost no one. So four or five people. So uh, basically, the short of the story is that um, some, uh, uh, this, this guy found some plants in his um, uh, field, a farmer. He sprayed them with Roundup, which is a uh, herbicide, pesticide herbicide. And, um, the, the plants didn't die. He thought maybe it was a super weed. Someone from university came out to take a look. It turns out that it was a genetically modified Roundup Ready strain of wheat that Monsanto had. Uh, Monsanto is a large multinational, for those of you who don't know, a chemical and agricultural company, sorry. Um, and, and so Monsanto had field tested this wheat in Oregon legally, but that was back in 2004, 2005. And here it is, 2013, this plant is showing up. Still sort of not knowing what's happening with it. Korea and Japan said so they won't um, uh, buy exported uh, American wheat because they're afraid of contamination. They don't want the GMO in their wheat. Um, what's even more sort of interesting and bizarre is that Monsanto's first response to say it was a false flag attack, that obviously uh, environmental activists had planted their proprietary, very difficult to get plant in some fields. But if you think about it, that's sort of an interesting tactic because that same week, some environmental activists in Oregon did hand burn a field of, of um, genetically modified beets, and no one has heard about that story. Um, so if you're interested in false flag attacks and their uh, efficacy, uh, you may want to uh, look at the Critical Art Ensemble's fuzzy bi biological sabotage and see how that might relate. Um, so, so we were really interested in this, and, and so one of our research methods is field trips. So the first thing we did is we went to um, 
the USDA's Federal Grain Inspection Service, which is in Portland, Oregon, the United States. If you don't know where that is, it's a west coast city between San Francisco and Seattle. And it turns out that 40% of America's wheat uh, leaves from that port. So the, the uh, US uh, federal government has a grain testing facility. So we visited them with some of our students um, as, as faculty members from college. They were amazing, so welcoming. Um, all of their equipment's like analog. They have things called, what are they, shakers? Like, they, nothing is digital. Like, they have these things that, like, shake the wheat and, and basically go out with the small particles and they measure it by hand and all this. So we were talking to this guy and we said, okay, so you, um, you test for uh, contamination and you also do grading. How are you guys testing for GMOs? And um, he was very forthright and said, well, we actually can't yet. We're probably going to have to buy that technology from Monsanto, Dow, or Cargill, Cargill or a third party. So to add another layer of complexity, whether this was a false flag attack or not, now the, F, now the US government, it seems, is going to have to buy the testing uh, kits from the very companies that are supposedly contaminating. So uh, things are getting very interesting. And right above the US FDA's uh, facility was the Wheat Marketing Council, which we can go more in detail about uh, if you want some time. So if you want to learn about other accidental releases like Event 32, you can see our book, or you can go to the Information Systems for Biotechnology, uh, which is a US website. There's also some European stuff coming. Uh, in this slide deck, but th this website uh, is basically hosted by Virginia Tech, uh, which is a university, and catalogs all of the applications that companies make to uh, the federal government to grow GMOs for testing purposes or commercial purposes, and it also catalogs when there's accidental releases or problems. Um, okay. Um, and so, with that, one of, um, yeah, we think that gastronomy is as much about acquisition as it is about um, preparation, we're interested in the provenance of ingredients. So, for example, a simple example is uh, wild-caught salmon is not really the same as um, uh, farmed salmon. And so we're not just interested in GMOs. There's also heirloom varieties, open-pollinated poll open uh, varieties, and local ingredients and that type of thing that we're interested in. And um, this is one quick example. We did an exhibition in uh, Dublin and we partnered up with a local seaweed harvester called Quality Sea Veg and basically wanted to display and make public the many varieties of edible seaweeds that they were harvesting just off the coast of Dublin. And um, we're excited about this sort of shift in focus from um, Molecular gastronomy, which is very much about understanding the chemicals and building it's sort of a reductive approach and building things up to create interesting foods, to uh, the sort of more noma approach, I suppose. So, for those of you who are foodies, there's El Bulli, which is the sort of molecular gastronomy restaurant, which um, has won Restaurant of the Year for multiple years, and now Noma, which is a Danish restaurant, which is very specific about its ingredients, like that fish was caught from that lake in that season, and blah, blah. And um, They even have a research and development lab. Yeah. So they're pretty geeky, which is cool. And yeah, and so I think that this is an example of food hacking shifting to food freaking. I would definitely consider Noma uh, food freakers in some way. Maybe they'll give us free tickets uh, to the restaurant. We'll find out. <laughs> and, yeah, so you can... Uh, so actually this all started off, all this research started off in 2010 when I was teaching at an art and design college in uh, Bangalore, India, Shrishti School of Art and Design, very interesting school. And my students were in a color theory class with me and we got into a conversation about the colors of vegetables. And it turned out that Monsanto, yet again, this uh, very large company, uh, was trying to get approval for a genetically modified aubergine in uh, India. And it would be the first... Uh, genetically modified edible food, uh, ed edible uh, plant in India. They already had GM cotton. Um, what's bizarre about um, aubergine is that it is indigenous to South Asia and almost every village has some specific cultivar that they've cultivated over you know, thousands of years. So you can see all these different colors, uh, shapes, and sizes. And um, so uh, with, with the students, we collected all of the uh, aubergines we could find in the local market, uh, found out their sort of uh, local Canada name, we got their English name, and uh, we started cooking with them and um, got really interested in this idea of biodiversity of the kitchen. Because partly what needs to happen in terms of um, uh, making our food systems more sustainable is getting people who are foodies or really interested in eating, who tend to be, you know, surprisingly, richer with people who are producing the food who often aren't or have different political persuasions. So we started attacking this from the aspect of, well, if 
if Monsanto gets their um, genetically modified aubergine into India, uh, your parents won't have the dishes they remember from when they were a kid. And since your parents are all upper middle class, that might really upset them. So that was the appeal we were, were making in this case. And we found uh, this one bizarre question, which was, uh, so BT Brinjal was the name of the genetically modified aubergine. Brinjal just means aubergine in Hindi. Um, uh, there's one question that wasn't in the press, in the English-speaking press anyways, in India was, what do these taste like? There was lots of questions about how they might affect the environmental health, the uh, human health, but there was never the simple question of what does it taste like? And when you ask that, you start to realize that um, Monsanto's not gonna have a huge product line of a bunch of seeds. They're gonna pick a few high-performing ones that maybe don't work or perform super well in the kitchen. So this is where all of our work sort of began, and we basically are a one-trick pony. We have one question, uh, which is, uh, what happens if I eat this? So we just pick weird things and we ask that question. So this is um, a little list of a few things we've wondered about what happens if I eat this. We'll talk about uh, glowing sushi and uh, smog in the future and f further on. But um, then these two are also interesting. Hypersweet hyper and sour pickles and the biosteel goat's cheese. So. I don't know if you guys have heard much about the biosteel goats cheese, but oh, wait, has anyone heard about biosteel goats? Oh wow! Okay, this is amazing. Oh, you guys need to just go to Wikipedia and look this up. It's true. We can't make it up. Um, so basically, there's a goat. It's a military project, U.S. Canada kind of shared thing. It's a military project. They put a trans gene that means they genetically modify a goat so that in its milk it produces a protein similar to spider silk, and then they milk the goat. The idea was they would milk the goat, they would harvest those proteins, weave them, and make armored um, vests. Because spider silk is the strongest material in the world. So the project is discontinued, but um, pretty soon a taxidermied version of a biosteel goat would be on uh, display in uh, Pittsburgh, uh, Pennsylvania, and the United States at the Center for Post-Natural History. So you can sort of get the full story there. But we basically asked a simple question was like, what happens if we milk this goat and make cheese out of um, that stuff? Like, we haven't been able to acquire any of the milk yet. But that is the question we have. Um, another uh, way of doing this research uh, is um, basically trolling databases. And one of the databases we tro troll is looking at um, uh, the EU's Joint Research Center GMO Info database. And that lists, again, for the e EU, all of the genetically modified plants that are grown by universities and companies in test sites. So these are outside of the lab. They're somewhere out in the world because they have to get approval to do that. And we found this crazy... Um, uh, what was it, a, a hyper-sweet uh, gherkin pickle uh, that was uh, produced cucumber. by uh, cucumber, that was produced by Warsaw University Life Sciences. And uh, we think that the idea was that you would then process these like sugar beets and get sugar. We have no idea, but we thought, oh, you can make hyper-sweet and sour pickles. And so we just did a drawing of this. We haven't gotten our hands on the, on the um, gherkins. But it's a way of just thinking through the extended implications of these emerging biotechnologies. Um, so now we'll just share a couple of our own uh, projects that have come to fruition with you. Uh, so smug tasting um, was sort of an idea thinking about what if food could be used as a biosensor and we used egg, egg foams to harvest um, air pollution. So this was again with a group of students in India and uh, we were reading uh, On Food and Cooking by Harold McGee in which he says, thanks to eggs we are able to harvest the air at the stiff peak stage egg foams. Uh, egg foam is approaching 90% air. So with that idea, we were thinking, well, if you can harvest air with egg foam, you can probably make air quality testing meringues. And um, it was sort of devised as a low-tech, uh, accessible version of digital biosensors. And uh, just a quick kind of experiment we did. And the tagline was, the tragedy of the commons never tasted so good. So. From there, the next um, project we've done is, well, another project we've done is the Spice Mix Supercomputer, which uh, was a traveling um, cooking demonstration that attempts to blend every spice combination possible on Earth. And this is, uh, it's the version two, uh, sorry, version 1.0 of the Spice Mix Supercomputer. There's an array of 25 spices, and through the tubes, you pump some air and it'll you select which spice you want to smell. And it's based on like an analog patch-based synthesizer for sound, and in this case it's for smell. And the idea behind this is that, um, uh, so this is a very low-tech version, but we do want to try uh, version 2.0, and which would be a networked uh, sort of smell 
sharing smells over the internet. Once and you, oh, we should say, once you smell the spices in this crazy helmet contraption, you then make the blend in the back, and we keep a record of all the different blends. And so, if we keep running this computer as it goes throughout Northern England for the rest of the time ever, we'll get all of the possible spice blends <laughs> in the world. So it could potentially be a sort of networked recipe making device or something like that. And um, yeah, we've worked a little bit with the DIY bio group in, in Portland to make version 2.0, but we're still in baby stages as I, of yet. We thought so this idea was totally crazy. I don't even know if it exists in science fiction. Like people really want, I mean, smell of vision, but people really want to network smells. But then we, in the last few months, we've seen two versions. There's a big research group at National University of Singapore, and there's a military contractor that are doing sort of like smell of vision. Um, and theirs are super high tech, and it's all about over engineering, getting the exact smells with special chemicals. And we just wanted to hack something together. And since you can get spices anywhere in the world, it's like printer cartridges, you could send these, at least that limited fidelity of smells across the internet. So that's sort of the plan. Um, and you know, we get inspiration from everywhere. Um, when we were in Europe like four years ago, we saw these, I don't know if you guys have seen these, maybe you're not supposed to say you've seen them. They're these sort of illegal milk machines. So farmers by law aren't allowed to sell all their milk. They have to dump it under EU regulations. So instead of dumping it and wasting what's pretty good tasty biomass, they make what I'm like, calling like the blue box for milk, which is just like this box that you go and put money and you get milk and avoid that entire regulation and system. And so food freaking is a bit clunky. Um, it's an all, but, but it's getting smaller, it'll get better. Uh, and you know, so we're really interested in alternative vending machines. So taking that uh, European inspiration, we brought it back to the US with us. And um, we in just, na just in the last uh, half year, we created Cedomatic with a couple of students uh, from the Pacific Northwest College of Art. And uh, it's a vending machine that dispenses heirloom seeds and small bags of soil. So these are the little seed packets you would get out of the vending machine. And this is it installed in a plant store in Portland. And uh, let's go back one. Okay. okay, so it doesn't take any electricity. We got an old uh, vending machine that you just sort of turn crank and uh, there's yeah, seed packets in the top row, and you can take it around to different locations, so it seems to be in some amount of demand. And then we um, have documentation of the seed savers that we invited to be part of the uh, vending machine. Uh, there's little videos of them online talking about the seeds. So the woman in the top uh, left um, created a new variety called Kalards, which basically was a combination of kale and Colored, Colored greens. greens, I believe. It was, I mean, Brassica always cross-pollinates, and she didn't keep them far enough apart. And she was like, oh, this tastes good. And this is a hugely different thing than we heard yesterday by the speaker who was talking about EU seed laws, where you, by law in the EU, are required to actually apply for a permit to sell seeds that you've created. And a lot of seed-saving organizations we've run into in Europe are basically illegal because they're, they're too expensive for them to do that and it needs to be based on previous accessions in the database or something and so one huge difference is that in the US you can just breed to your heart's content which is both good and bad um, but there's not any sort of regulation like that but it also means that we have the videos because there's not information about these seeds other than sort of oral information. And so as a counter to yesterday's talk which was about European um, seed saving and how difficult that is this is sort of an example of the American version where there's the Seed Savers Exchange which has been around since the 70s and it's a huge catalog that uh, of home gardeners uh, sharing the seeds that they've created and there's currently over 12,000 varieties that you can uh, choose from and exchange. I don't even know if they have a digital version so there's definitely some amount of yeah. like reaching across the aisle and talking to sort of super dorky ag folks and food folks and maybe providing some skill sharing. I yeah, and I, it's sort of perhaps an example of a folksonomy. Uh, <laughs> and here you can see some shots we took of the inside of the booklet. And it, it just sort of, it's like a telephone catalog, but for seed savers. So you can just look up, you know, what kind of seed you want, what region you're in, and find specific seeds arranged for your, or developed f for your bioregion. Okay, so uh, there's been a big development since our CCC talk. We had a lot of fun sort of, uh, this was 2011, introducing this new body of research we were doing on mutation bred plants. So we won't go into depth on it. You can watch that talk or another one for more of the depths. But we wanted to sort of update you on it and say that we are making a barbecue sauce now with these plants. We were hoping to bring it in service to you today, but there's been some uh, bottling problems, so I apologize. We don't have it yet. But basically, oh, you want to do this one? Yeah. What you need to know about this story is that basically since the middle of the century, um, 
through starting with the Adams for Peace program in the U.S. and all over the world, not just the West, like East Asia, Africa, there's been mutation breeding programs, and it's um, programs that use radiation and chemicals to uh, induce mutations in plants, and that a lot of these plants um, are in our food system, and most people that we talk to, including biologists, uh, life scientists, et cetera, don't know about this history. Um, these are two gamma gardens, as they're called, uh, where they would um, lift up uh, radioactive material and expose the plants, and then they would mutate. So we wanted to do just like a quick and dirty reality test. So we knew that um, red, ruby red grapefruits in the U.S., which is sort of a generic name, uh, some of them were mutation bred. So we went to like the local corner bodega that's sort of, you know, saying we're organic and we're hippie. We bought three uh, grapefruits, and here they are. And you can see their sticker numbers. Those are their PLUs. And we looked up their PLUs, and it turns out that um, two out of three of them were, in fact, mutation bred. Now, we didn't know that right away. We had to do some digging and look at the name and compare it to the database, the International Atomic Energy Authority's database. So unlike GMOs or organic, mutation bred is not, it has no legal sort of status in the marketplace, only in terms of um, the UN's FAO. But uh, the, the, these uh, prefix numbers, at least in the U.S., they're four uh, numbers usually. If it's preceded by an eight, it means the GMO. If it's preceded by a nine, it, it means the organic. There's not one for mutation bread, and there's not one for organic GMO, which, believe it or not, is actually, I believe, still a legal thing that is possible in the U.S. to have a genetically modified organism that is grown organically. So um, anyways, back to the mutation breeding. We were finding a lot of these uh, plants, and they're, very, they're easily available in the market, and we wanted to do something with them, sort of to like bring them together in one story. So we made a barbecue sauce, and this was a photo shoot uh, for an advertisement we're doing for our barbecue sauce. Uh, got a little smoky. Um, the first uh, food that's in it is a Golden Promise barley, which is a varietal of barley that we found in Macallan uh, Scotch whiskey. They're actually phasing it out, but one of the cool things is Scotch takes a long time to age. So because we're just like 10 years Scotch, we're getting what they grew 10 years ago. So they were still at that time using Golden Promise barley, which is a, a mutation bred uh, barley variety from the UK. Um, we're using real red grapefruit juice, which you can buy at a just generic uh, store chain called Trader Joe's. They have real red grapefruit juice, so that goes into our barbecue sauce. It tastes super good, by the way. I know this sounds a little bit intense, but it's actually very tasty. Um, and then Murray's Mitchum peppermint is uh, probably one of the most ubiquitous uh, mutation bread plants. It's, it's actually grown in uh, eastern Oregon. A lot of the peppermint oil um, that's used for food, or peppermint extract, I should say. Uh, uses this variety because it's supposedly blight tolerant. And at the bottom, you'll just see that's sort of the, the program that maintains the database of all this, because as we always like to say, it turns out that if you have radioactive material, you have to fill out paperwork. Um, so, sort of interesting. Um, and another, I guess, example of food freaking in one of our older projects is the Glowing Sushi uh, Cooking Show, which is a cooking show that finds an ex unexpected use for the first genetically engineered animal you can buy. So in the US, you can actually purchase um, glowfish, which are genetically modified uh, zebrafish with, uh, that, that are made to glow. And they were uh, accepted into sales through by saying that they're a pet. There was no kind of legislation at the time that prevented this from happening, and there was some debate. But, but they sort of came through as a pet. And so we were saying, well... And, and that's really bizarre because that law has changed now. So the US FDA has changed their rules and you have to prove to the government that a genetically modified animal is a drug and um, not something else. Um, and so that it comes under drug intellectual property laws, which you know benefits the big companies, but also um, to, to not scare away uh, consumers. So this is both an orphaned organism and it's been grandfathered in. Um, which is really bizarre. So we did this cooking show, we put it online, nothing happened for six months, and we're like, well, that was a flop. But we really wanted to have a conversation about it, and then some really bad British newspaper, the Daily Mail, wrote an article saying that glowing sushi was being served all over the US, and it was the biggest food trend ever. And we were living in Europe for two years, and the, we kept getting calls from journalists saying, is this true? And we said, we have no idea, you should just call a sushi restaurant and see. Um, but so we made this dish, um, and, and we wanted to satirize the, the innovation paradigm. And, and, and this is something we're all guilty of probably here, is a bias towards, oh, it's innovative, it's new, it's great. And what's really interesting about this is that um, it's had so many different names. So is it a pet? Is it a drug? Is it a product? Is it an organism? Is it an ingredient? And you can't have it 
um, only the ways that you want. You have to either accept all those things or none of those things. So what we basically did is in our contact with the company that produces this and some of the other folks, we basically used their language and said, oh, you guys did such a good job of um, you know, innovating and making this glowing fish, and then it didn't really work as a pollution sensor as you wanted, so then you innovated again, you made it a pet, and now we're innovating again, and we're making it this wonderful dish that glows in the dark. And it's very disturbing because they don't know how to use that language back. They're like, oh, I guess you're right. Um, and so uh, we actually got to interview the original scientist who invented this in Singapore, and he was very interesting, and he didn't know anything really about it except some Texas business and paid him a lot of money to like license the technology. Yeah, and I think the point of the whole um, kind of exercise was to say, well, whether it's a pet or a drug or whatever, however you choose to classify it, at the end of the day, it's a fish, which is uh, part of an ecosystem and can very easily, you know, enter that, uh, enter multi in multiple ways, either through through our bodies or through cats eating them out of your fishbowl or through being dumped down the toilet when they no longer are entertaining you as pets. And what was really shocking is there was actually some in-depth conversation on YouTube. I mean, granted, if you go look at this video, there's tons of like, you're stupid, I hope your arms get bitten off by alligators, whatever. Um, but then there was actually some sophisticated conversation to the point where people were like, I'm as pro-GMO as they come, but this is disgusting to me. I need to rethink my beliefs. And we're like, whoa, that's perfect. That's what we wanted. Um, so. Those are some of our projects, and then we'll just tell you about this a little here book, and then we'll um, hopefully have lots of time for a Q and A. Um, so we're really glad that we managed to make this little book because it was sort of an opportunity to think through what f food freaking is and what it isn't, and basically creating a framework for this term or this space. And um, I think, as I said earlier, there are lots of food freakers already out there, and it's basically anybody who's geeky about food politics and policy and that kind of thing. So issue zero was sort of about establishing the terrain, and um, we hope that for the next uh, versions that there'll be more you know, articles from multiple people. Any of you interested, let us know. Um, so. So this is, the, we basically, as one way to get our heads around what food freaking might be, we made a four quadrant diagram, which we can't actually remember the name of from math. Mm -hmm. uh, but basically the axes on, go from open to closed, uh, the y axis, and from um, illegal uh, to legal on the x axis. And that sort of pink tongue part is where we think food freaking sort of sits. So you see that it's mostly on the open side, uh, but there's maybe some illegal uh, behavior that's uh, permitted, uh, as well as some legal. And the different sections we have, I'm just going to quickly read these. Um, section A is legal and open, open source food design and participatory food design. Section B is illegal and open, um, culinary civil disobedience and outlaw ingredients. Um, section C is illegal and closed, so black hat food hacking and food crime. And section D is legal and closed, uh, proprietary food engineering and closed source food design. And uh, then there's a bunch of lists of all the different topics there. We're trying to have some fun with it too because uh, you know, it can't be too serious. Um, so this is what the different section of the books looks like. Yeah, so the open source uh, food science, I think, you know, yesterday we went to talk by a guy making metamate and uh, who spoke about open source cola. And I think that, uh, yeah, both for their business models and their dedication to open source um, culture, we sort of thought that that would fit perfectly within this. For us, one of the big... Um, I mean, they're, they're doing such amazing work, and I know they're putting a lot, a lot of stuff in English, but the amount of stuff that's happening in Germany in general, and Berlin in particular, is so awesome. Like, we're really inspired by what's happening in those scenes. Um, so just to explain two, um, two projects within the illegal and open section, uh, the culinary civil disobedience and outlawed ingredients, um, there's the non-browning Arctic apples. So that's a, a product the Canadian grower is trying to get approval for. It's a genetically modified um, apple that has a gene silenced, and so basically it doesn't brown. You know, when you cut an apple and expose it, um, it turns brown. And on the face of it, I'm like not stressed about that. I'm like, okay, that seems really silly. And the more I thought about it, I was like, oh, that means they're going to pre-cut apples and put them in plastic bags so they can serve them at McDonald's. That seems pretty pathetic. Um, so that would probably be the... Uh, what do we say? The bad ingredients. Yeah, outlawed ingredients. And yeah. on the other side, there's the raw milk clubs who, um, in multiple places around the world, raw milk is now becoming illegal for various reasons. Um, some of them are health-related, but it's often not so much. And um, 
so illegal uh, raw milk clubs would, f for example, be an example of sorry, culinary civil disobedience. Uh, so they're doing it relatively openly um, and... And this is not an imagined thing. Some of our colleagues in the U.S. where raw milk is illegal um, do you know, illegally once a week drive out to a farmer and buy their raw milk. It's sort of their thing. And just a quick note on these, on the book, um, they're really short. The whole f these little comments are tweet length, which made it really hard to write them. And there's like hashtags at the top, which you can't really read in these slides. But um, if you'll see that later. Um, we're almost done. So this was actually an amazing lesson we had in the Netherlands when we first came here, what, three years ago, two years ago now, um, working on a project with uh, designers and artists for Genomics Award and hosted by Vogue Society. I think Lucas a second ago. Um, we were like, oh, yeah, there's these invasive ingredients, there's these invasive organisms, these little crayfish, and we eat them in the U.S. They're so delicious. They're actually from Louisiana, and they got brought here by a restaurant in The Hague who didn't like them and dumped them in the river, and so now there's this huge invasive problem. So we'll just collect them all up and eat them. And so we started thinking about that and making recipes, and then we talked to Bram Kosa, the like, uh, crayfish expert of Netherlands, who told us, actually, crayfish are really annoying because if you, if you hunt them and you accidentally grab an alpha male, um, all the uh, betas get larger and the entire biomass gets worse. So please don't fish them. <laughs> so we were like, okay, that's a, so that's an example of, you know, learning from your mistakes and not going crazy. Um, and another, this, on the other side is, um, in, uh, again, sorry this is so U.S. specific today. Usually we have a much broader uh, palette. Um, there was a bunch of tests in markets in, in New York and it found like, what's the number there? I don't know, some huge amount, like 60% of the fish was mislabeled. And so on the one hand, they were doing genetic testing to prove that, which is interesting because that's one of the things science does, right, is it, it, it can verify and, and sort of end arguments. On the other hand, um, it's interesting that people haven't cultivated enough taste to know that the fish they're buying isn't that thing. And so I think just like some of these skills that we are doing here, like lock picking, um, that are sort of these lost arts, just being able to taste the fish and identify it seems like something worthwhile and interesting to, to, re to retain. Um, all the images in, in this book are Creative Commons license, or, or most of them are, uh, with the licensing here, and the book is also Creative Commons license, and something we're always trying to do with our artwork is make as much stuff open and accessible and free as possible. And so the last note on that is we still think, after all this, that we have always been biohackers, and we shouldn't be scared of that, but we should be very critical and thoughtful about how, that's <laughs> to how that story is being told in the mainstream media. Okay, so... Uh, these are some of the databases that I mentioned today. I'll put them up on, uh, on our website, but it's the EU's DOORS, their protected designation of origin database. The International Atomic Energy has a mutant variety search. I don't know what the G is for. Uh, database, the EU, EU's uh, genetically modified organism info database. Um, there's PLU lookups to look up product codes and it gives information about different products. Um, and then there's a huge one, information systems for biotech, and that includes all the accidental releases as well as um, the applications that companies and universities make to the federal government to get approval to do field tests. Okay, so that's super geeky. I'll end there but we'll, with that, but um, you guys can, uh, if you're interested in that. We have lots of folks to just quickly thank. I won't say them all, but um, we've worked uh, quite a bit in Asia, and we have a lot of folks that have helped us out there. Um, uh, one actually thing that I see that's not mentioned here is Hacteria, which is a sort of DIY bio group that goes between Eastern Europe and South Asia. Um, lots of folks, particularly here in Europe. Um, I know I saw Lucas Evers here today from Vogue Society, and he's been great. Um, and we've had a lot of other good support, uh, particularly uh, here. And then the US, um, some of the folks that have supported us in this work. And that's it. Thanks. Questions? <laughs> yeah, not bad. Thanks, interest. Can I? Yeah. 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 Thanks, interesting talk. Um, not, not sure if I should ask this, but if you can answer it, but I'm tr going to try. You mentioned that nature is fighting back against Monsanto by making Roundup Ready weeds. Um, I wouldn't phrase it that way, but yeah. <laughs> I will, yeah. and I like it. Um, I, I, I fail to see how the genome of Roundup Ready stuff in wheat gets into weeds. Do you have any clue? How what? I'm sorry? How, how, can, how can you get crossbreeding between weeds and weeds? Oh, okay, yes, yes. Now, that's, that was what the confusion was. The farmer sprayed his field with Roundup, and because the plants that were there didn't die, he thought they were super weeds. Now, maybe it was the farmer's son. It's unclear. How do you not recognize wheat if you're a farmer? But anyway, that's the story in the press. Okay. And so he thought so it was super, super weeds. weeds. Super weeds are weeds that um, 
grow regardless of, of being sprayed with pesticides. Right. They've, they've, grown, they've grown tolerance. They've been, basically, I mean, this is why the word nature is interesting, right? Because we're unintentionally selectively breeding for a okay. variety of weed that is actually resistant to something we've made. But we can, you know, nature, it's fine. I understood the genome was carried over, and I didn't understand that. Thank yeah, you. And yeah. weed is in uh, undesirable plant, not, not weed, which is ubiquitous in the Netherlands. <laughs> Hi. Um, some trade negotiation are beginning between the U.S. and EU, and agriculture is part of it. And I know that in the EU, a lot of people are very nervous about this because the uh, U.S. has a policy that is not really well admitted from an EU point of view on GMOs and antibiotics and hormones. What do you think about it? What's your point of view? The system's bad all around. Um, both from the EU and the US level at the federal and then sort of super state level. Most of the laws, as far as we can tell, are written by lobbyists and large multinational companies that don't support farmers, family farmers, eaters, are terrible. Um, for me, and maybe that's one of the interesting distinctions, is that the US is a highly unregulated place. A lot of what we saw since the 90s was because the US was pushing neoliberalism. Um, and, and, and trying to, through the WTO and World Bank, change agricultural policy across borders. The EU, in part, resisted that and made laws that protected farmers so they wouldn't you know, have this sort of um, farm failure and that work would be sort of um, exported to the east or to the south. But in that process, the EU also developed laws that were at times highly restrictive. So the example that heirloom seed savers in the EU can't just save seeds and sell them or, or, or continue to crossbreed them. Um, so. It is pretty bad all around. Probably my suggestion is uh, more awareness, more interest, particularly from this crowd. We're artists, we're not hackers. We talk to this community because there's a thoughtful, critical debate that embraces new technology, but is hugely aware of the political implications of it. And so that's why we like, try to keep coming to these events. So thanks for having us. And I don't know if you have additional thoughts. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Thank you. And we have about 10 books. So first come, first serve. They're 15 euros each. And we'll be in the media room. And if you want a free PDF, uh, just email us. And we haven't put it up online yet, but we'll send you the free PDF. Yeah, yeah put in the next 28, 48 hours.